Hello again, this is the second part of my recording with Hamish from Joinery Business Assist, in which he will demonstrate the principles of lean manufacture and factory flow that he uses in his coaching. If you missed the first part, then you can find the link below and that is available as an audio as well. I hope you enjoy it. And if you're watching this soon after it comes out, please send over to me any questions about lean manufacture because we will be doing a final recording with Hamish answering all the questions that we've received. You will find that on the pro tier of my membership site. Again, look for links below. Um, so, you know, I, I really ought to talk a bit more about lean and how it applies to, yes. to degree, so that people can can ask some questions. I've got a thing, you know, it's it's probably something I'm going to flash through. But um, oh, great, yeah. I'm going to share again and just um, flash you through this, which. Are we still on a black screen or has it shown up yet? I'm still seeing a black okay. screen. Oh, here we go. No, production potentials, lean flow. Got it. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a, a guy I worked with in Sydney who had kept every scrap of board. You'd be familiar with mm. that. Every offcut, every misordered bit of board. Um, this is, you know, one corner of his factory. This is it hmm. after several skips worths of, of stuff's been. Oh, taken. I didn't even I didn't realize that was the same corner at first. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So I mean that's that's there. That's yeah. that pool. And he had then had space for a a two week scheduling board. They could actually hmm. get to the the firefighting equipment. <clears throat> and you know, they had a, a designated don't put anything in the in this space. <laughs> Not sure what the pair of shoes is there for, but um, we'll learn them from that one. But um, this is all under the banner of, of 5S housekeeping, which you know we normally start with with and you know people who've been in in a in a place for years and years can accumulate a lot of crap. You know he had yeah his cousin's motorbike and I think he had five wheelbarrows up in the rack and tools from his uncle and, you know, everything that had ever passed through just never left because he hadn't done a sort. He hadn't got rid of everything that wasn't relevant for the current jobs. Yeah, and, easily you know, done. Um, the other part of that, that 5S is set, is a place for everything and everything able to go back in its place really easily. And, you know, uh -huh. this... Uh, edge tape spilling out onto the floor and um, a terrible, terrible, mm -hmm. you know, somebody looking for something is going to lose the will to live. It doesn't take much to put it into order. It doesn't take much. You know, that sort helps get rid of the stuff they don't need. Um, these guys actually went yeah. to a scannable barcode. I think it was Sortify system. And people in the office could... Oh look on that system and see what edge tape was in there before they ordered stuff. Great. So they didn't end up ordering 300 metres of edge tape that they didn't need because it was already yeah. there. Um, we've we've hoarded stuff before only yes. to store it poorly and then buy it again Yeah. because we can't find it or it was damaged. Which is so common. It's, you know, unbelievable. I've worked with a couple of guys, a couple of brothers who just had to employees and it wasn't until they actually did a, a a stock check and a stock take that they found they had you know they thought they had nothing yeah, excess in the place um they had thousands of pounds worth of stock hmm. that they they just bought and you know one brother had not talked to the other brother and away they'd gone yeah um keeping the place clean that shine element can really help and, and having the materials, you know, even a really basic setup like this for a cleaning station, uh, a shovel, a brush, and a, whatever that is, a witch's broomstick. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the place for it to go back, so you've got the yeah. set, set built into that and you've, you've given people time in the day, you know, start of the day, end of the day, end of Friday afternoon to do the cleaning. Or, you know, at the end of a job, clean up before you start the next one. But, you know, you, you end up yeah. with clean, well-maintained places. You standardise your processes so that, you know, you've got this three-month rotation on board. Are you using that still? 
I was afraid you were going to ask. <laughs> yes. So we have we've slipped a little bit, but I I think Matt and Brady actually have just done another clean out. We did slip on the three month rotation. Yeah. Thing, and we have got a bay that has become Al's special junk bay, which I I know you would give me a snap on the wrist if we were still. No, I, I, if you've got a special junk bay, it could be like this. But once you get full, then if you want to put something in there, you've got to take something out. Yeah, well, that, that's, yeah, it's just getting at that point and then I have a conversation that's the, with that's Brady. That's the, the disciplines of yeah. standardising things and making sure yeah. that everyone is on the same page. Um, and then we, do, we don't yeah. have those, oh, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, we've got to make a decision, oh, I've got to, you know... Push it against we the, do, push uh, it against the look, guard of the CNC. Um, yeah, yeah, there's still a little bit of that. We, we, we're a lot off. better than we were. Yeah. A lot better than we were. And it's mainly when we get busy, we slip a bit and then we re reinstate it. Yeah. Um, the busy times I've, I've, are the most important times to be sticking to things. Okay. That's my um yeah. My little I'll my little nagging. <laughs> <laughs> um, because Keep, keeping things going can can have a huge benefit, that sustained part of things, which is mm. the most difficult because mm. we get busy, standards slip, we're, we're too busy to do this, we're too busy to do that. Um, and that's, that's you know, the slippery slope. Communication is real key. If I can ju just briefly in interject on that, I've done the yep. five S's. When you were talking about profit first, the big takeaway for me of that is a is a shift in mindset because profit first is saying, as the owner, you don't take the dregs that are left over after you've paid everyone else. You say, I'm in business to make profit, so you allocate profit first. Yes. That was almost the most significant takeaway for me. And with the 5S that we did a lot of work on, We've gained the most traction when our mindset has shifted. And so when we got the wood burner, I found it far easier to throw away off cuts. Because we, despite what I said, we are actually doing very well compared to what we used to. We 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 don't hoard unnecessary little parts at all. Yeah. Um, and it's been really helpful for me to say, well, that just getting rid of this is actually a benefit a benefit because it heats the workshop, or we don't pay for skippage. And so there's the shift in mindset from this part's valuable in an, in an offcut spay to this part's valuable being getting gotten rid of. And in fact, I suppose the ultimate destination is for my mindset to be this part is not valuable at all knocking about. Because we are pretty much there with that mindset as well, that you over the years, you see the waste of taking up all your storage space with bits that barely get used. And once you have once you have your space back and you just cut from a new sheet again, the whole process flows more efficiently. So I, I suppose I, I'm seeing that the coach must get under the psychology of get into the psychology of that person to help their motivations shift. So they go, aha, I know why I'm doing this, not just I must keep clean because someone's telling me to, but I've got better things to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a you know, fairly big business and a guy had been in the same place for 20 plus years got furious with me when he had to throw out an awful lot of stuff at the start of the, the program. But, you know, he had whole packs on the floor in front of racks that he couldn't get to. Mm. And unloading a truck was a disaster. Finding material and taking it to the CNC was a disaster. Everything was chaotic and disastrous. And he was really angry with me because he'd had to pay for five or six giant skips and he was going oh that material is all worth this much money this much money this much money and it was worth nothing yeah. it's just it was costing him money to move time and time again and it was wasn't necessary for a job and the the, the key was he'd been the estimating team had been over ordering things and with you know yeah. that problem solving thing going back to the the starting point he had mm. too much stock because the process wasn't sharp enough in estimating because he was rushing things because he was in the commercial space. So they were rushing and ordering uh, because oh, we've got to get this job done really quickly. And actually sometimes going a little slower makes everything faster. Okay. And you know, one of his 
yeah. his feedbacks from 5S was he was walking through and not seeing a mass of things everywhere and stock and works in progress and you know finished goods piling up. And it made him really nervous. But then he was looking at the bottom line figures and going, oh, no, we're getting more through and everyone's actually busier. But it looked like nothing was happening. So did he thank you in the end? Oh, yeah. Yes. And then he was okay. going, you know, give me more things. Give me more low-hanging. <laughs> give me this. Give me that. You know. um, sure. But, yeah, um, I don't know how you're going with the board or a, a system that duplicates what would be seen on a board that's easily shared. Well, that's an interesting one because we've had many iterations of this in almost every available wall surface of the workshop. So there was a time when we said right down at that bottom end is where we'll put this board up and we'll have meetings. It just didn't work because it was too much of a trek to get down there. Yep. So then we realized this, yeah, this board needs to be where you see it. So yeah, a couple of different places there. And I think though, for us, it was something that we didn't feel the benefit of enough because this board when you've got multiple jobs going through the workshop per week multiple staff members to manage i totally see the value of it yes we i think we're trying to implement something that we weren't really feeling the value of and so what we do now is there's a very brief meeting which i know is what you recommend not too long yep usually 9 nine thirty when people have got into their task for the day and then come back and it, it's in it's in the office now and we do it over service mate so that's that is the, the equivalent of our board we may get a big screen in future we've tried that but you know it works for now with a small team around the laptop what's happening this week who's doing this let's fix this problem let's crack on yeah. so yeah we, we're not we're not doing the board but we may we may move to it as things get busier yes um i obviously some people just go either you know cut a hole mm. in the in the board and put a screen in or just have a screen to start with and they've got a schedule there and it's color coded by operation or it's color coded by person um but everyone being able to see what's coming up is a real key yeah. because if you can't see it then what you're doing at the moment can expand in time magically expand <laughs> yeah um, to you know, go oh well, there's no rush because you know it it, it takes the time it takes. Um, mm. But yeah, uh, one guy in in the UK, he had a great offsider. It was him and and one other guy, but he'd never given that person uh, a view of what the customer was paying for. You know, so this job okay. the customer was paying for five hours of machining and seven hours of assembly mm. and you know an hour of uh, quality checking and, and dispatch and, you know, you know, 10 hours of install. It wasn't until they did that that this guy was then going, oh, okay, I've got a target now. And he was yeah. naturally competing with himself to do it within that time or less time. And no job previously had happened within the estimated time. Just giving the, the guy the visibility end up with everything was happening in, in the time it required or less. And One of those things that's obvious when you say it. It wasn't because the, the guy was a bad, he was a fantastic worker, but he just didn't have, he had, you know, the, the blinkers on, basically. Well, I remember Bruce saying there were no bad people, just bad systems, or I forget exactly how he said it, bad culture. But that, that sort of situation where the guy in charge may be getting frustrated because stuff's taking longer, yes, that can yeah. cause interpersonal conflict. And, and resentment. Could lead, you know. Yeah, resentment, definitely. But it's a simple fix, isn't it? It's transparency yes. and getting on the yeah. same page. And you know, time and again, people have done that. And you know, time and again, you know, sometimes you aren't charging the customer enough. Mm. Those hours that you're estimating and... and you know, those labor hours that you're charging for aren't enough. But without having them tested and a bit of a feedback loop, you're never going to find out that you're not setting enough time. Or, you know, yeah. you've, got a, you've got a super skilled person who's the business owner and they're really committed and they, they can do something in five hours, but someone else can't. 
you know, yeah. you can you can schedule five hours because that's how long it would take me. But you've got to be realistic that it's going to take other people seven hours. And, you know, sometimes they've got to stop to unload a, a, a truck, a, a lorry, or they've got to do something else. And, you know, you're not actually putting that that stretch time in all the other tasks they've got to do. So, you know, sometimes yeah. this, these boards can can be a real game changer for people. Or, you know, a, a system of scheduling that, that brings the times in. And I think this is important, understanding the principle behind the system. So one is visual control. Yeah. The the other is is scheduling. And I think we've we've taken those principles into how we run. So we have clipboards yeah. up where you can see them. We have ways in which all the team plugs in and knows what's going on. But currently, it's not a big whiteboard. No, but it, it, the real key is communication and sharing yeah. the information to people and trusting them. With, you know, um, a lot of people go, I'm not going to put it up because it's going to change anyway. But that's you know that's what the beauty of a whiteboard you can you can get a a whiteboard um, eraser and and change it and but you know if you're yeah. not if it, if it if it changes and you're not you're telling Mark but you're not telling Adam <laughs> then Adam's in the dark and and Mark's doing something else and you know it becomes chaotic. Yeah. Um. I, I really like this little structure where, you know, you're thinking about all your processes under this bucket and all your processes under this and working through from the start point through to manufacturing and install and then thinking about what the processes are and then what the problems, issues and bottlenecks are. And, you know, you can end up with a lot of things down here that you've just been putting up with along the way. But, you know, unless you're actually looking at these, you're never going to be fixing those processes and making them better and making them the mistake proofed processes that we need to, to really help with problem solving. Mm -hmm. And I remember, um, you know, with you and Brady, there was a bit of a mismatch between um, you doing things in SketchUp and producing a cutting list before you had the CNC and then Brady was redoing your work. So you're, yeah. you're both doing the same process and those hours, um, whatever it was, you know, a couple of hours a month or whatever it was, were a waste of time. But it wasn't until yeah. the two of you sat down and, you know, me from the other side of the world was making you put them into a into an Excel sheet that you worked out that, you know, maybe you could just trust Brady to do the cutting list with the app yeah. that he was using. And then it saved you that time and you could get on and do other things. Yeah, that, that's yeah. right. Sometimes Trust, putting, putting, this, putting this down can, you know, with really long established cus customers, you know, long established businesses going, oh, yeah, actually, we don't have a, a process for handover from sales to hmm. manufacturing, from sales to production. We don't have a process for handover. You know, we put it in, in, a yellow box because it's something we've got to set up a process for. Yeah, these these things are all necessary. They are quite daunting. And yes. I think that the, the point when a business goes from a one man, one woman band to getting staff and having to produce more, it, it's, a, it's a big step change because if I'm the designer, maker and installer, there's so much that's in my head that I need zero time to communicate to anybody. Yeah. Okay, maybe a note so I don't forget. But I can be at a job survey thinking, well, I'm going to I'm going to build this cabinet in this way and the door in this way. I then build it, I then fit it. Mm -hmm. The the challenge I found is the communication of details and not over communicating and finding that balance of how do we get this done. Well, that, that the way is I used to really. do it. Yeah. That, yeah, um... so it does is yeah, go on. Enough information, but not too much, because you don't want to give people information yeah. they don't they don't require. Because, you know, I, I, before I joined the joinery coach many years ago, doing lean, I was with a, a commercial joinery company, and they would produce paperwork this thick, and give that to everyone, so people would be having to leaf through 
ridiculous amounts yeah. of paperwork to find the bit that was relevant to them. And it was, you know, it was a a soul destroying, <laughs> yeah. time wasting, um, over over processing approach to to the wastes of production. Well, I guess you either detail how everything's done on every job, or you standardise. And yes. this was a big thing that you worked with us on standard processes, which took me a while to get my head round because it's bespoke work. But actually, we do make doors the same way ninety nine percent of the time. We do use the same feet most of the time. So as soon as you've standardized something you used to have to communicate, then that pack of communication can just go down to a basic instruction. Yeah. And everybody everybody assumes that if it's not specified, then then we we do the standard way. Um and that's that's working fairly well in our business now. Yeah. Um, I mean you you, yeah. you really um grasp that idea of the, the wastes that motion, that transport, that holding too much inventory, um, you know, the, the over-processing, the, um, the defects and errors and everything like that, you, 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 you got those concepts pretty quickly. And yeah, think- I'd, say, I'd say the value of that was immediately apparent to me. And it, when that was a mindset shift because to me, waste had meant this piece of board that's sadly going yes. in the skip. Yeah. Now, waste is the time messing around that I don't time, need to Time spend. and effort and some angst and drama sometimes. Yeah. And these guys, you know, really simple little carts um, for their plastic feet and the the lugs for the plastic feet, which had previously been in a range of, of cabinets against the wall. So every time somebody wanted to get one, they'd have to go to a cabinet and, and mm. oh, you know, I've got 10 cabinets and I'm, I'm I four for each, so I've got to get out 40 and put them into a cardboard box and lug them around. They got them out and put them in here, and they were topping them up directly from a larger storeroom to here, and this just became mm-hmm. something that could wheel up to a bench and get used from there. And they, So those little carts are doing a lot. You've, you've got your – you're reducing your wasted motion. You're also introducing visual control because you can see yeah. when one runs out. And some, somebody's task then became to top them up in the morning. Okay. And then, you know, that would go back to the, the storeroom where they had the Kanban system and it got down to a certain point, it, it triggered a reorder card. Hmm. But also when they got all these out of the cabinets along the side, they found all the stuff that was buried underneath. Them. <laughs> okay. And there was about, you know, one and a half thousand dollars worth of stock that this was sitting on top of that they didn't know was there of other things. I mean, this was um, something that got developed over time. It, you know, this is a there's a, a further development of this, but um, a lot of uh, cabinet shops making something straight off a bench and onto here, starting in the corner with a you know that it's not going to overhang, and you're tetrising all of your base cabinets and then your upper cabinets on top, and then that can be. Um, plastic wrapped, picked up with a forklift, put onto a, a transport vehicle, oh. and the way you go. And you know this this guy <coughs> is um it's the same guy who was going to be doing huge movements of machinery in in Tasmania. Hmm. He has a a, a small um, little flatbed and a, a trailer, and you know average job would be three three times backwards and forwards with this and a bunch of people stopping assembly to go and pack and walk backwards and forwards carrying one cabin at a time and it just went to one person with a forklift loading and they done huge saving they'd done all the all the packing and stacking on the floor next to the benches and then the wheels took it away they could shift it away with wheels take it across the road, put it, store it by job, or, you know, pick it up and put it straight into the hair. And they were um, they were worried they weren't going to get as much use of the space, as much utilisation of the space. And they found that rather than three moves, the average job was going down to two moves because they were consolidating wow. so well on these platforms. I see. And but, I'm thinking re- reduced risk of damage, probably yeah. 
reduced staff back problems and things just put it on yep. this platform at a low level and um not scuffing things not damaging things moving them around dragging them across the floor because mm. you know he's got the uh this is just spare board but he's got that nice sort of semi-carpeting material oh yeah um he made it lighter by taking out these stiffeners and just having a fifth wheel in the bottom underneath oh yeah and you know it doesn't sag in the middle um just yeah some of these things evolved from one person's starting idea and then we just you know other people who then took it on came up with brighter ideas and um like a magpie the the job of a coach is to steal the good ideas and then pass mm -hmm. them on to the next people so that they they other people have done the learning and development for you and that's that's continuous improvement right we improve yes. on what someone else yep. has done and then continue in our business right. okay these guys had all their hardware underneath a, a roller line that the parts were coming up on um and everyone's having to bend down bashing their head picking things out you know you can't clean it's a bit of a nightmare and we just came up with a really nice each bench had one of these that wheeled underneath, wheeled out. The, all the things they use the most of are easy reach from the mm -hmm. top. Everything else has got a space. Um, you can wheel it out, clean the floor really easily. You're not bending down and coming up and bashing your head on a bit of steel. And one person's job in the morning is to run around and top everything up for 10 benches. And, um, you know, Pretty happy people building things into benches as much as possible so that you can have a clean top. You can do your work on here and you don't have to have these things out and on the top and moving them when you've got a bigger, bigger thing you've got to work on because they're built in and, you know, hanging your, your power tools up, hanging your, your okay. things off the side where it makes sense. You know, all of, all of these ideas are, are really pretty useful as well you know some people go for a little separate side cart i know you 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 tried one of those i'm not sure if it's still in use we tried a few iterations of all these things we just recently dismantled the last cart of that sort we'd made it it was sort of like a mobile desk with storage yeah. in it i think as our as our roles clarified and it was clear that brady was the main maker and he was usually around a particular workbench. Things did become static again, but he does he does have one wheeled tower of um, they're like Festool sustainers, but it's a different brand, and that has his fixings and certain small tools in, and that does get like things get pulled out and yeah. the tray gets put next to him. So yeah, we've we've experimented and found what works for us. Yes, I mean yeah, finding finding it and you know having wheels on things can be a, a real key as well. You know, well, especially with benches, the... because if you've got, you know, work that's suddenly changing its format and you know custom stuff, yeah. you might need to make a big space. You might need to wheel everything over into into the corner. You might need to wheel benches yeah. together to have a, a larger working area. Yeah, yeah, I can see the benefits of that. We totally rely on the wheeled carts for boards. They're used all the time for boards and other things um we went for for two large benches and that's worked well for us but it does depend on the space the type of work you're doing and the yes. personnel so yeah but yeah like you mentioned earlier those those standard procedures different formats for having them but um the really important part is is deciding between you what is the best most efficient best quality mm. um safest way of doing things and you know that's yeah. that's one of yours, I think. I, I copied that. It is, you. yes, that's right. Yeah, copied that from your um, um, member site. Yes, although that is Gemba now Docs. Yeah, get, I mean, little plug for Gemba Docs. We find that the easiest way to create these documents. It stops us getting bogged down in formatting a Word document or something like that. And it's it's integrated with a QR code, so you can just put it up in the workshop, and people can look it up on their phone and yeah. edit it. That's the that's the important thing because this, I mean, this. Prime example, this is a totally redundant process because the price of birch ply went up. We we subsequently got the CNC and edge bander, and we now make our drawers from melamine. Yes. Um, and I've 
I've learned with it, with any process document, I've learned to try and make it pretty rough and ready. And Gemba Docs makes that possible whilst also looking quite good. Because going years back, when I had a, a certain instinct that we needed to document how things are done when I got my first apprentice, I just spent far too long creating this detailed document, which always, always changed for one reason or another. Yeah, going down going down the rabbit hole with these things is, is a real um, trap. I, I, I remember watching you three guys editing one of these about turning, turning on and running the CNC machine mm. and the ease which with the, with, which you can drag and go, oh, no, that, that's not step two, that's step one, and dragging yeah. it around and then putting putting the notations underneath is, is really good. What a lot of people I've encouraged to do is um, take a video, have a, a YouTube channel that you make a private channel, and then, you know, when you, like, on a, on a YouTube video, you can click share and get that URL link. You can go to yeah. a free site that makes a QR code for that. And we've got yeah, you know, people I've worked with have got, you know, how to maintain this machine, how to run this machine, how to set it up for two mil edge tape, how to set it up for one mil edge tape, and it's a scannable QR code that takes you to a video of somebody doing it the best way. Yeah. It's an interesting one, the video versus this kind of document, because I, I originally leaned more to video, but what I found is that the video is great when you first learn how to do it, but when you've basically got it in your head, but you just need a little reminder, yeah, it's quite nice to scan and go to the the step you need. Yes, and this is this is what so Tom Hughes, who set up Gemba Docs, he runs an electronics company, and it grew out of their need for standard documents. He he, I don't think he's even got video integrated into the system now because he said that for the reasons I said, he just feels it works better as images and text. But it you know it's situation dependent. Yeah, no, I mean yeah. it's it's clean, it's straightforward, it's easy to follow. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to to mark things up as well in there as well in that app. Mm. You can put a circle around things. Um, yeah, scheduling is is the key. You know, not not over over committing on a day, not making things too early, having a, a schedule where you're working back from the date mm. that you require it. The pool schedule is a real key uh -huh. and. Um, Part of that also is is sequencing so that you're doing things, you know, rather than one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing in a great big long timeline. Sometimes you can drag things out and do them at the same time and sequence okay. things. Um, we've got a lot of people who uh, I've worked with who make the drawers first. They, they run the drawer parts first, make the drawers. This is an early, early version, these, these couple. Um, mm -hmm. That's a very unsuccessful one. But you get, you know, you set up a, a sub-assembly bench and the drawers are made really efficiently in one place by one person and everything to make them is there. And then you fill up one of these tower block towers. And then when you're making a drawer cabinet, you make the drawer cabinet turn around, the tower block towers wheeled up close mm -hmm. to you. You grab the drawer and put it in. You know, I've, I've been in places where people make the cabinets, put them all on the ground, make one drawer at a time, and then they're kneeling down on the ground, putting them in, and it's an exhausting process, and they end up, you know, with bad knees and the toes of their boots scuffed off. Yeah. Um, and it takes far more time than they need to do. But, yeah, sometimes those sequencing, sequencing of processes is, is really important as well. That's when you get a, a little bigger and you've got more people and you can go, you know, that's, this person could be doing this while this other person's doing this. Yeah. But it's all about creating flow and making sure that mm. there aren't bottlenecks, there aren't holdups, there aren't stoppages along the way. And if we can get that flow going, then you really can, you know, um, benefit from, from having wheels on things, um, benefit from sorting parts so that, the person at assembly has got them pre-sorted and they're just going, oh, this is all the parts for one cabinet. Bam. It wheels up to the bench. I make it, check its quality, check its dimensions, and I'm done. And, it's, uh, and that simple principle of vertical storage was a game changer for us. Yeah. 
something else that's so obvious when you, when you start doing it. But previously, we'd be stacking everything up right, uh, flat, and then need the thing at the bottom. Yes. Yeah. And you've got more more sorting time and more risk of damage, and um, you just yeah, the wastes are built into your process. Yeah. That that visual management, um, I think, speaks for itself. Really, here's one that, example from you. I was about to say that looks familiar. It is actually hardboard, yes. isn't it? Yeah, we still we still use that off and on. Im impact Wait. on one axis and. Um, um, results effort. was it effort yeah effort on the other so you know yeah minimal minimal effort and minimal impact large effort minimal impact um yeah. minimal, minimal effort and maximum impact these are the things you're going to be trying to put in place first but the real key is you know you've got 10 ideas you're not going to lose any ideas and you yeah. know, given a suggestion it's there and it's captured and they're yes. not going Oh, I made that suggestion, and then it never happened. It's it's been given a priority. They can see where it fits in the the general run of things. I think something like you know these these quadrant ideas I've always liked, but this is just a really good practical application of it. And yeah, yeah that that means everyone knows which order you're going to be working on things. It knows, you know, which which idea is is going to have the biggest impact, and we're going to bring that in first. But making things yeah, visual, so useful, yeah. <clears throat> making things labelled as much as possible, having the procedures available to see, rather mm -hmm. than you know traditional somebody's slaved away at a procedure, printed it out, put it into a folder or mm. a binder, and then hidden it somewhere in an office, and nobody's ever looked at it. We've we've definitely suffered from that before, and that's another concept with the Gemba docs. I think Gemba docs comes from I don't know what language, but it's something to do with at the point of need. Yes, I, I yeah. believe. And so you say, well, we put the edge bander um, procedure QR code on the edge bander, and then we we remember that it exists for one thing. Yes, and we it, it's minimal effort to actually use it. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, another one of yours. The, yeah, um, I spent a long, long time sourcing and organizing these blue boxes, yes. labels, etc. Yeah. Um, have you ever run out of these hinges again? No, no. I mean, it's. I suppose it's it's quite a good thing to revisit, and I so I take it so for granted. It's not visible to me how much of a benefit this is making to my business because it just happens now yeah but it's dealt with a lot of past problems of restocking yes yeah because when when that front when that front compartment's empty we reorder but the back compartment covers us for the time that it takes orders. for the stock to come in and you fill it up again yeah. you never end up with five boxes of these you never end up with with none of them and having to run down the road to, to go and grab some yeah it's a yeah, it it's, works it's a beautiful, simple, easy system. Um, you know, it can can be a bit of an effort to set it up, but um, once you once you've done that that hard work, um, it's it's a it's a great thing. I mean, this um, little Velcro card has got the same details for these screws. You know, the supplier, the what they are, the number to order, the order code itself. That goes on a board. Somebody. Twice a week, takes a photo of the board and orders, and then when the stock comes in, it goes back. And you know, yeah, nobody is is hoarding screws and hiding screws in their bench anymore. They haven't got the the locked cabinet door. <laughs> Nobody's yeah, doors in. doors off. That that was a big insight for us. We we used to, in the old workshop. We had well, for one thing, we had a lot of drawers or sort of wheeled boxes that once they were wheeled in, you couldn't see what was in them. A few door covered cabinets. We have very few. I don't think we have any doors on any of our storage areas now. We have maybe two drawers. So there's one under Brady's bench where he has his different grits of sandpaper. But actually, that's more like a backup store because he's got them in visual transparent boxes on the wall at his sanding station as well. Yeah. And everything else is open fronted units, blue boxes, or just like tools on a shelf. And you can see from the other side of the workshop where it is. Yeah, it made major inventory visual visual yeah and um 
taken away a lot of headaches. Yeah. Some some people need checklists. They they thrive from having a checklist, and it's a it's a visual way of error proofing things. You know, some people record errors, and they've got a um, a nice set category for it, mm. um, and they can they can go through and go. You know, we've got this many of this one, this many of this one. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to have people making up their own categories. You've decided in advance what they are, and you know, some sometimes you just need the the number. Going, oh, that's a six. Mm. And then you're putting them all together and, and presenting them visually. Yeah. yeah. And you can be going, okay, this is the one that's affecting us most. Um, I've got an update of this where it, it adds in the financial cost as well as the number of times it happens. Wow. And um, you can be going, this is our big issue. We're going to focus all our effort on finding out why this is starting, why this is happening. Then we're going to solve that's what, the, that's the, the, the great value of it is because it's one of those things where when you first told us to error track, it felt like yet another administrative task. Yes. But it, it has ended up sticking. It is something we still do because I've seen the value of it on a number of occasions. So we have, we use Airtable, but we do categorize and we do see the summary of where most errors are happening. And straight away in all the chaos and overwhelm of running this business, I can say, well, this is the problem that we need to fix first. Yeah. Um, you're not trying to fix 10 problems at once because mm. you've got that data of, of where it's it's most impacting you or most happening or um, you know causing the most pain for your staff or customers or whoever. And you can you can focus in on that. Yeah. Productive maintenance, making sure that people, the operators are involved, that the operators understand the equipment they're using, the machinery they're using. Um, it's it's really easy to have a service technician come in and send someone off to do something else because having them stand next to the service technician going, I don't want to pay you to, to do that. But actually investing that time and bringing the the servicing in and scheduling that time can can have a payback as well because your operator becomes far more knowledgeable. They can take mm -hmm. on some of that stuff that you're you're paying a professional outsider to do. You know, quite often people are paying them to to come in and do things that the operator can do themselves. But yeah, making sure it's scheduled, making sure it's regular, making sure the operator is involved. We end up with equipment that doesn't break down. And cause massive holdups. Um, is productive maintenance like the opposite to reactive maintenance? Yes, a reactive maintenance is fixing something when it's broken. Preventative maintenance is that that program where you've you're going. Oh, every six months we're going to look at this, and we're going to bring someone in, and you know, bring the technician in, and make sure they do a full service. Productive maintenance is bringing in that that idea of having the full service regularly. But also involving the operator and make and upskilling their knowledge on mm. the equipment they're using to get to the point where they're going. That doesn't sound right, mm. and that that would be because of this. And you know, not using something and then making it worse. Um, but yeah, uh, quite often it is. It is goes back to that five S. It's the cleaning. It's the lubrication schedule. It's those sort of things that keep keep machines going forever. Um, you know, in a in a non joinery business I worked with years ago, it makes um, quite a lot of roofing, but they do also do um, pipe crimped into a sort of uh, a ninety degree angle, and they're using uh -huh. a general machine from eighteen ninety three, wow. and it's going to last probably another 120 years, <laughs> years. they built things build things properly then and probably not over complicated yeah and it's just looked after because the, the guys that run it really love the machine and they they look after it and make sure it's perfect 
And they... yeah. It reminds me of that there's a place in, in Eureka in Northern California that I was lucky enough to visit. It's called Blue Ox Millworks. And there's this old guy called Eric Hollenbeck there who has mostly old machinery. And a, a lot of it's powered by, um, is, I think it might be a water mill with these, these old sort of leather belts turning other wheels. Um, but one of his bits of machinery is probably of a similar era. And you just get a like a picket fence um, slat. You sort of stick it into this thing and then use it as a lever. And somehow it cuts this beautiful sort of gothic art shape on the top. And it was such a wonderful little machine. Totally ancient. But yeah, give it an oil and it will run and run, I think. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I, a, lot of, a lot of people with the CNC, how many different grease points have you got on your CNC? Quite a few. It does have a distribution system, which theoretically greases, well, most of them, That's at least the track ones. Automated. Well, we do have to pump the lever, so we do yeah. have to remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, is that is that a scheduled thing? Do you do you have a, a program of time to do that in? I need to I need to check with Matt because we we were getting mixed messages from the different engineers, very very mixed messages about okay. how regular was necessary, and we were reluctant to do it too often because we were getting oil drips messing up our work. So it's one yes. of them where I don't know if we quite have decided as a team this is exactly how often it happens. It's a little bit do it when it seems necessary. So that yeah, that's something to something to pin down. I think and. Uh everything everything marches on so innovation can be a, a really mm. wonderful thing and these guys have got their their benches and a line where the parts come up pre-sorted but mm. people are making cabinets and then having to you know if you're on this bench you're having to march the whole length of the factory to go and put it to where it was going to get sorted for oh, being sent out and they brought in a train track on the floor. Oh, okay. So that yeah. I thought that was a ro on the previous image. So that wasn't a roller bench all along the left hand side there. Yeah. So that's, that's a roller bench a for the parts. Oh, it is. Parts that come out, okay. pre sorted. Uh -huh. And then you guys are taking them off and making the cabinets here. I see. The cabinets were coming off. And then the the most highly skilled, highly paid people were stopping putting cabinets together to carry them. Hmm. And now they've got a laborer at the end of the line. Each uh, cabinet's got a sticker on which identifies it, and then they're getting sorted onto pallets at the end of the train line. I see. And these guys are just getting on and making far more cabinets in a day. Okay. And you know the the cost of putting it in was pretty minimal compared to the the savings that they got back. So they, they did their their you know calculations on return on investment and just went okay. We're going to employ somebody at, you know, two-thirds of the price we're paying these other guys to stop and do this. They recorded some of the time that it took them, and it just made sense to, to make that change. Yeah. So that's a, a, a brief run-through of, of some of the things Lean can do for for joinery. But obviously, it's not, not a cookie kind of program. It's about mm -hmm. finding the things that apply to people's individual circumstances. So, you know, uh -huh. if I start working with somebody, it's about trying to find out what they need, when they need that element of things, and then chopping it up to make sure that we're doing the right thing at the right time. And it does suit so their goals and their, their needs and what they need to get out of it. Who would be your target customer, your, your ideal client? Um, well, I've, I've worked with people who, you know, it's two or three people in a, in a firm up to 20, 30, 40, 70, 100. But, um, you know, the, the ideal is someone who's got more work than they can cope with. And I can probably help them. Interesting. Interesting. So, okay. So, so if someone comes to you and says, I'm, I don't have enough work, I'm not pricing enough, I'm inefficient if everything's just not working in their business, what would you say, what would you tell them to do first? I think uh, probably sort out their their pipeline into the 
into the sales element that marketing you know I'm, I'm not an expert in marketing by any means um but i know it's a it's a pretty effective thing when it gets done correctly and it's somebody mm -hmm. who knows what they're doing it can really bring people to your door and it bring the right people yeah. to your door rather than chasing you know any and every bit of work you go this is the work I'm interested in. These are the people I'm interested in working with as customers. Um, and a, a really smart marketing person can go out and target those people and, and bring them to you. Um, yeah. Well, just, just briefly, we're now working with a marketing expert who I hope to bring on to a video like this in future on the membership site. And she has really opened my eyes to things that I... I knew a little bit about so target customers building a customer persona and speaking to them in the right language but she's she's just putting touches on our website that straight away I look at it and go that is so much more appealing and so much more high end and I'm not even sure why and it's things like we used to say we make alcove cabinets and wardrobes and she says well no your your titles want to be living space and bedrooms and so it's steering my messaging towards what the customer really want is interested in so they want yes. to improve their room they're not so interested in the mechanics of how it's made as i am so yeah so um okay so yeah we've we've certainly learned that mar marketing is absolutely fundamental but as you say when that's working there's definitely a need to make those efficiency improvements yeah it's, especially especially as a business grows and there are more people to communicate with and i, I can so, i can yeah. help with you know the ideas about profitability pricing things uh -huh. correctly because that all does link into having a schedule and bringing things through that way and you know the change management and the leadership element of things also works into what i do um okay i, I don't i don't over emphasize that that need for that thing but you know it's it's vital to be doing it correctly the communication and the the setting the big picture and delegating tasks, getting people to cooperate rather than directing them and, you know, bossing mm. them around. Um, you get a, a far better result if people are on board and um, enjoying their work and enjoying their time. Mm. And you're far less stressed if you are delegating things for people to do who are given the skills to do them, given the time to do them. Um, they're willing to do them and they're trusted to do them properly without, you know, being micromanaged. Um, yeah. All, all of those things, you know, I can I can help with. But, yeah, obviously my biggest focus is is the, the efficiencies and the, the lean concepts and how they apply to, to joinery. You know, we used to talk about a, a, a concept – in a theoretical way and then in a practical way, how it would apply to the business and then come up with steps about these are the actions to do. Um, okay. So, so for, for anyone watching who is interested in those subjects and, and might even be interested in getting more input from you in the future, we'll have a second session where we'll do a Q and a, so yeah, let's, let's gather questions. So do for those listening, do send over to me. Um, I'll put details about how to contact me below this, send over to me any questions for Hamish. And the format will be that I will, I will pose those questions to Hamish and we'll do our best to cover all of them. Um, to get ahead on one question, which I think people may have, is you're based in Australia, right? Yes. So you're, you're from Britain, you're, you're permanently based in Australia. Uh, it was... I think an issue for me in my coaching experience that the coaches weren't physically present because I think subtleties were missed and progress could have been made faster if we were stood together in the workshop. Yeah, there's How definitely, definitely a, a, a huge benefit from being able to, to walk in and, and meet people. I, uh -huh. That said, I, I've, I've done work with people in Australia during COVID where I haven't seen them. Um mm -hmm we've never met in person and, and they've made huge strides but my intent is to obviously with family um to get back pretty regularly to the UK and if I can be um doing that and and having a business purpose to it then that makes it even even better for me 
So, you know, if I can get back every four four months or so and incorporate some some family time and work and visiting people and and you know following up on coaching things, then that's great. And from a from an Australian sense. perspective, Britain's really nicely small and easy to get uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well that that makes sense and uh, i mean i i've got you on here because i do feel i can personally vouch for you i've had i've had a, a mixed experience of coaching lots of good some not so good but i do feel that i always connected with you and i think that underpinned the success that we did have in certain areas where although you weren't physically present i did feel you took the time to understand and our needs and what we were trying to achieve and so really I did feel with you that the trust remained there because there were things that you you encouraged us to implement which didn't quite stick but I suppose that's always going to happen yes but yeah. I did feel that, that I ultimately trusted you and that relationship in the coaching context was was working so I'm certainly happy to vouch for you from that point of view um so yeah anyone anyone that's interested and wants to hear more from Hamish do drop us a, a question and, and tune into the next um installment yep that'd be great there are no stupid questions there might just be some stupid answers <laughs> okay <laughs> hopefully not too many oh, no. i'll put your contact details below shall i hamish we haven't actually talked about your business name i think was it joinery business assist yes yep yeah i'll put all that that below that'd okay be well we'll we'll leave it we'll leave it there thanks for all that and uh, okay. we'll see you again thanks Alistair.